time. Time is the continued sequence of existence and events that occur in an apparently irreversible succession from the past, through the present, into the future. It is a component quantity of various measurements used to sequence events, to compare the duration of events or the intervals between them, and to quantify rates of change of quantities in material reality or in the conscious experience. Time is often referred to as a fourth dimension, along with three spatial dimensions. That is the Wikipedia description of time, a dimension and a unit of measure that moves in one irreversible direction. The constraints of time are the inspiration for a lot of classic stories. From H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, published in 1895, Robert Zemeckis' 1985 masterpiece, Back to the Future, and even the contemporary Marvel Universe's multiverse-themed onslaught of movies. Time is also the irritant that led to the busy pace of the modern world, from the TV dinner to the demand for faster and faster planes and trains and automobiles. Time is the invisible but always present reminder of our own mortality and of our fallibility. The idea of a time machine has been around ever since we realized what time was, and I think at times we take this for granted. It wasn't that many episodes ago where we discussed the U.S. Army's Stargate program. Psychic spies, remote viewers, and on at least one occasion, a psychic sort of time travel that took Joseph McMonagall to the planet Mars, one million years in the past. Sound crazy? Check out the episode, The CIA's Project Stargate and Life on Mars. Or check out the LorenLegends.net link in the episode description, or read about that account on the CIA's website for yourself. This should be a clue that the idea of time travel has, at least on some level, made it into the minds of folks with serious budgets. Remote viewing, for the sake of this episode, is probably one of the most interesting things to consider. Roughly speaking, the idea is that an energy of sorts is out there and connected to everything, and if we can tune in to the right frequency, so to speak, we can understand the information carried by that energy. This is, of course, how radio and TV work. It's the same concept, just a little more on the metaphysical side. But what does metaphysical really mean? Have you stopped to consider that the universe is thought to be something like 80% dark matter? And do you understand that the word dark matter is a made-up word for unknown? Seriously, our standard model of physics only accounts for a very small percentage of the behavior of the universe and everything in it. Dark matter, you could say, is almost like a gigantic fudge factor to make that standard model make more sense where it doesn't. In many ways, you might even say dark matter is a rebadged version of the concept of the ether, an infinitely small form of infinite, well, something, that permeates all of space and time, and allows light, energy, anything to exist and interact throughout the universe. The point being, the amount of stuff we know is dwarfed by orders of magnitude by the things we don't know. So where exactly is the line between physical and metaphysical? Or do you feel more comfortable if we instead phrase that as, so where exactly is the line between science and science fiction? Well, that bleeding edge is certainly where the great minds of scientific discovery exist. But shall we get a little stranger? One concept is that this energy also carries the reverberations of the past, fuzzy, distorted, and faint, but still existing nonetheless. It just takes more expertly tuned hardware to filter out the signal from the noise. Not unlike tuning the dial on an old AM radio. There is a story, a legend, if you will, of a time machine that was assembled by, of all people, some Italian monks working for the Vatican. Sometime in the 1950s, with the help of some legendary and powerful names in physics like Enrico Fermi and Werner von Braun. Our story starts in the early 1950s in the electroacoustics lab of Father Agostino Gamelli at the Catholic University of Milan, which he founded in 1921. Father Gamelli, now 78 years old, 
was working in his lab with the young 27-year-old Father Pellegrino Ernetti. Ernetti was a musical genius in his own right, who would go on to publish several volumes on the subject. Together, he and Gemelli were experimenting with various ways to record and filter and modify sound and its resulting electrical signals to produce higher quality audio. Now, how do you react when something you are working on intensely, or something that refuses to cooperate or just breaks down? Do you swear, or do you have a catchphrase that you repeat? Father Gamelli did, except rather than swearing, he would quietly say something along the lines of, What now, Dad? Innocently asking his deceased father for help, which is of course much better than swearing. As Gamelli and Ernetti were attempting to record one day in 1952, their recording device kept malfunctioning. Frustrated, Father Gamelli looked up and quietly asked his father for help. To the shock of both men, a voice, the voice of Father Gamelli's father, answered them through the recording device. They were stunned, paranoid, and even a little afraid. What was the voice? Was it really Gamelli's father? Was it even real? Was it a demonic trick? Or had they inadvertently done something they weren't supposed to do? But the younger Father Ernetti was more curious than anything, and convinced Gamelli to do the same sequence of events again. And to their amazement, the voice responded again, in a humorous fashion, and using a childhood nickname of Gamelli's. The men were in awe, and struggling with the ramifications of what they had experienced. You see, in the Bible, in the first book of Samuel, chapter 28, King Saul of the Israelites uses a medium to summon the ghost of the prophet Samuel from the dead to attempt to gather some advice. Forbidden, damnable black magic, if you will. And Saul is ultimately told of his impending death and the death of his sons. It is not a pleasant event. Gamelli and Ernetti allegedly visit Pope Pius XII and told him of the incident expecting to be chastised, but quite the opposite. Pius instructed them to pursue this mystery even further, arguing that it was merely science and that if the result were genuine and repeatable, they may have the first actual, tangible modern evidence in favor of the belief of the afterlife. Over the next several years, the experiments are said to have continued, and on-again, off-again contributions, according to Father Ernetti, were made by several prominent scientists of the era, including the likes of Enrico Fermi and Werner von Braun, but no one person having the full picture or knowledge of the device that would eventually become known as the chronovisor. The device ultimately consisted of three major components. An antenna array capable of detecting virtually every sort of wavelength and made of some mysterious metals. A directional array of sorts that allowed this energy to be tuned to a specific place or a time, and a third component that allowed for the recording of audio and even the display of images from the targeted time and location. In early 1956, the core chronovisor team was ready to fully test the device. The first target was Benito Mussolini, the tyrannical Italian dictator. The reason? Because the team was of course mostly Italian, and also because there existed lots and lots of video and audio recordings of Mussolini to compare to. This was a success, so they moved back to an earlier known date and person, Napoleon Bonaparte and his conquests in Italy. Once again satisfied, they went further back in time, to the reign of the Roman Emperor Trajan, and then to a famous speech given by the famous Roman philosopher and orator Cicero. Satisfied yet again, they went to one of the most impactful events in human history, the last week of Jesus of Nazareth. They witnessed the Last Supper and the crucifixion of Jesus, and even claimed to have seen the resurrection at the tomb before shutting down the device. The team went back to Pope Pius with the results and recordings of what they saw and heard, recounting each event in detail. The story of the crucifixion even challenged some of the minor yet commonly held beliefs. For example, Simon did not want to help Jesus carry the cross. He was forced to, etc. Ernetti also recounted the resurrection as being such an unusual and extreme scene 
no one had the words to describe it. Ultimately, Pope Pius decided that the machine was too dangerous. Humanity, he felt, could not be trusted with a device that would effectively eliminate the possibility of keeping secrets and the concept of trust. The argument was that some things may be best left unsaid. Hard decisions made at the state level, or even minor things done by individuals, even if they're helpful. Humanity, he argued, was not ready to be presented with the ultimate ability to know and judge our fellow humans. Pius ordered the machine to be disassembled, and its components and plans locked away somewhere deep in the archives of the Vatican. The primary source for the story of the chronovisor comes from the account of Father Ernetti, as relayed to Father Francois Brunet and recorded in Brunet's book, written in French, called The Vatican's New Mystery. There is also a book you could perhaps find at a library near you called Father Ernetti's Chronovisor by Peter Crossa, which itself is an English translation of Crossa's original book written in German. Both go into more explicit detail than I did here about the people involved and the sequence of events. Ernetti was initially open about his experience on this project, and of course his story falls into the same world of he said, she said, fake evidence versus real evidence, versus information versus disinformation that is rampant through virtually any conspiracy-oriented topic, whether it's UFOs or the Kennedy assassination. At some point, though, it seems evident that Ernetti was discouraged from speaking about the topic, and he drops off the radar, save for the account of Father Bruni. Pellegrino Ernetti passed away in 1994, perhaps taking with him the only known first-hand account of the world's first time machine. And Father Bruni, who wrote what we know of Ernetti's account, passed away in 2019. What stands out to me is the nature of the chronovisor. They aren't physically going back in time, and thus can't interact with the past and inadvertently change the future, avoiding the complicated chain of events as depicted in films like Back to the Future, or needing to invoke a complicated fantasy such as the Marvel multiverse. They are merely seeing and hearing what came before. This is not so unlike the experiences of the remote viewers who, decades after the chronovisor, claim to have viewed events in the distant past by tapping into the same mysterious energy. Do you think it's possible? How about plausible? And if it did happen, how do you feel about Pope Pius's decision to dismantle the device, fearing that the technology could fall into the wrong hands? I, for one, favor Pius's alleged decision. We live in a world that increasingly does not believe in redemption. Everyday people are hung out to dry for old tweets or pictures. So imagine if no moment in your life could be lived with any expectation or any level of privacy or trust whatsoever. Not all secrets are evil. So imagine if your most hated politician had something like the chronovisor. Or do they already? If the device existed, did the powers that be at the Vatican really get rid of it? Did no one put it back together? Could there be a little cabal of people playing games on the world stage with information that we are not all privy to? And when you think about it, what inspired the U.S. government's idea of spending untold dollars viewing the past in the first place with the possible idea that they would get results? And let's not forget the story of Gemelli and his father's voice or Saul and the summoning of the ghost of Samuel. That wasn't really the past speaking, was it? What happened to that loose end? The universe is a strange place, and if you believe in the supernatural, as I do, then anything is possible. Thanks for checking out Lore and Legends, and be sure to subscribe and share the show with your friends. I apologize for being absent the past few months, it has been a very busy summer. Busy in a good way, and I hope yours was too. But I'm ready to get back into some lore and legends, and I hope you'll continue to join me. See you next time.